eternal purpose of God. We will begin by looking at the eternal purpose of God. And uh, I found that understanding this brought a great blessing to me. Gave me a deeper understanding of the gospel. And I, I hope. I hope that I can relate this to you today. Um, have you ever wondered why Matthew begins his book with a list of names? I mean, the first 17 verses of, that, of chapter 1 of the book of Matthew are a list of names. And to most people, if you're honest, it's a boring introduction to an interesting book. Most of us have skipped through these names and just pass them by, let's get to the interesting stuff. And I've done that, I, have to, I must confess, I've done that. But I've thought, why did Matthew begin such an interesting book with such a boring introduction? You see, the audience that Matthew was writing this book to, to that audience, this list of names was a, of colossal importance. Matthew in his book used the word fulfilled about 16 times. His intention was to prove that this man, Jesus, the Messiah, the carpenter who was crucified, is the one who has been promised in the scriptures, is the promised seed that has been promised to the human race. Amen. And he begins his, his book with a list of names tracing the seed, this Jesus, back all the way to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the way to Adam. We will get to that in, in a... In, in a short time but that's pretty much why Matthew begins his book with this list of names now we all know that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden God came and while talking to the serpent he promised a seed he said in Genesis 3:15, we all know it he said and I'll put enmity between thee and thy woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God promised that he is going to put an enmity between the seed of the serpent and between the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman is going to bruise or crush the serpent's head. That's a promise that God gave. We all, we all are, are aware of that. So that's how the promise begins. Now, we all know that this seed is Jesus, right? Amen. Nobody in here doesn't know that. But I've asked myself, what is is the relationship between this seed, this promised seed, and all creation. We know the relationship of this seed to us. We know the relationship of this seed to God. Right? We all here in this room, we believe that this seed, this Jesus, is the Son of God. We all believe that this seed is the son of man. But my question, what I'd like us to dwell upon in this first session is, what is the relationship of the seed, or what is the identity of this seed in relationship to everything that was created? What is his relationship? And I'd like us to begin by reading a passage in Hebrews chapter 1. If you can come with me to Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Alright, now, in these verses, Paul gives us a lot of information about this promised seed, about Jesus. Now, we'll go through them one at a time and see what he tells us. First, he says that he is the heir of all things. That's what the scripture says, right? If Jesus is the heir of all things, that means he's the owner of all things. Then it says, by whom also he made the world. In other words, Jesus is the creator of all things. The Father created everything through Jesus. So God the Father is our creator, but Jesus is our creator also. It also says that 
This Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image. So Jesus is divine and he is the image of God. Amen. It also says that he is upholding all things. In other words, Jesus is the sustainer of all things. It says that he purged our sins. He is our savior. And it says that he sat down on the right hand of God. He is our mediator. Amen. So in this Three verses, Paul tells us that Jesus is the sustainer of all things. He's the creator of all things. He's the owner of all things. He's your savior. He's your mediator. And, and so on. He's divine and so on. Now, I want to focus on, on one aspect in particular. That he is the sustainer of all, the, of all things. He's the creator of all things. Come with me to Colossians chapter 1. We'll read another verse there and then we'll, we'll, we'll explain it a bit. Colossians chapter 1. Beginning at verse 16. Let's begin at verse 16. For by him, that is by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and are in, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now we all read these verses before, and we all know them, and, and, and all that. We have a tendency to think of Jesus from the beginning of sin till eternity. And anything that has to do with Jesus before sin, we just think he is the son of God, end of story, close book, move on. But what I, what I want us to spend the first session is to look at the relationship or the identity of Jesus to all creation before sin. Because when we see that, you're going to see something that is beautiful, that is going to open your eyes to the gospel and see it in a way you've never seen it before. Now this verse says, it says what, what Hebrews said, right? But I like the way it puts it. It says, all things were created by him. They were created for him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. What does consist mean? Pull together. Pull together? Yes. It also mean they have their being. All things they have their being in him. Or all things have their life in him. Amen. This is not after sin. This is before sin. You see this, this seed, this divine seed that God has promised is the one that everything was created by. Is, is your savior, is your mediator, is equal with God, is divine. Not only that, but he's your sustainer. He's a sustainer of all things, of everyone before and after sin. And in him, everyone before and after sin, find their being and find their life. Are you starting to get, catch the picture I'm trying to bring to you? Alright. And this verse does not limit it to the human race. It says all things that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible. Anything that ever was created. They find their being, they find their cons they, they, are, they consist, they find their being, they find their life in the divine seed. That's what the scripture says. Notice what else the Bible says in John chapter 1. Come with me to John chapter 1. We've read this verse many times, but I, but I want to put it in the perspective that we're looking at now. John chapter 1. Am I going too fast for anyone? All right, John chapter 1. Let me know when you get there. Okay, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. It says, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made, Thing made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Now we take that text. And we apply it to us 
on this side of sin. That is true. That is true. In Him, we find our life, and He is the Lord of man. But notice, contextually speaking, what John is speaking about. He's talking about before sin, creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He's talking about before. And in that context, he goes on to say that all things were made by Him, and without Him, nothing was made. And in that context, in that time, he says, in Him was life. Question. When anybody was created before sin, where did they find life? What does the scripture say? Are you following me? In Him was life, not after sin only, before sin. In Him all things consist, not after sin only, but before sin. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get clearer soon. Notice in 1st John, 1st John, the same author of the Gospel of John, 1st John, again chapter 1. He says some words that are very similar to what we read in John chapter 1. But, but he adds different descriptions so that shed a bit more light. 1st John chapter 1, 1st John chapter 1 beginning at verse 1. The Bible tells us, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. Now who is John talking about? What did his eyes behold and what did his hands have know? Who is he talking about? Jesus. Jesus. And he says, in parentheses there between brackets, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that what? Eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. In Him was life, and the life was Lord of man. In John tells us, and here he says, this eternal life was manifest unto us. So that life where John says, in Him was life, what life is it talking about? Mortal life? Temporary life? It's talking about eternal life, that's what he Tells it in 1 John, right? So in Christ, in this word, in this divine seed, was found eternal life before sin. Maybe there's nothing new to you. Maybe it is. I don't know. So why why am I emphasizing, emphasizing that? Any creature that was created before sin, whether visible or invisible whether in heaven or under heaven, angels or human beings, they all were created and they all found their life in Christ. Amen. If they wanted life, where did they go? They, they were not... No creature on this earth was created with life inherent in Him. There is life independent of God. No one. Only God originally had this life and the life that was with the Father He has given to His Son to have life in Himself and Jesus has life of that sort. But every other creature that ever existed or ever will exist have life because they have it in someone. Who is that someone according to the verses we looked at? It is Jesus, right? So, when God created Angels, let's say. What were the angels created under? Or what principle were they created under? Servants, yes. But, but in the context of life. Possessing life. From Jesus. From Jesus, yes. Can we put it that angels and all other creatures that were created before sin, they were created under the principle that in Christ... All creation is blessed. 
Yes? Yes. Amen. You follow me? In Christ, all creation possess eternal life. This was the principle that God created everything under. You follow me? You might have heard of this term that in Christ, everyone is blessed. But I'm, I'm, I'm showing you from scripture that this principle existed as long as God existed. It was under this principle that the angels were created. And we are going to see very soon that it was under this principle that Adam was created. Actually, we'll look at it now. When Adam was created, the Bible tells us that he was made in the image of God, right? We all know this verse, Genesis 1, 26. He was created in the image of God. We also are told in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9, that God made man upright. Upright means righteous. Adam was created righteous. We know that Adam was not created dead, was he? No. He was created and there was life in him. He was created and he was given dominion over the whole world. Right? He was created crowned with glory and honor. We are told in Psalms chapter 8 verse 5. So when Adam was created, he was created possessing life. What, what sort of life was it? Was Adam to die if he didn't sin? No. no. He was created possessing eternal life. He was created righteous. He wa was he pure? Yes. He was created. What, was he sanctified? Yes. Was he saved? Yes. Was he, re he, didn't need any, he didn't need salvation and redemption, of course. But I'm using terminology that, that we, we can relate to. He was created righteous and possessing of eternal life. Now tell me, which law did Adam obey to receive that life? So Adam was created dead and God told him if you obey the law of God you will earn life. What law did Adam obey to earn eternal life? What law did Adam did Adam obey to to receive eternal life? Nothing. 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 Adam was created righteous. He had the righteousness that is without the law. Why? How could Adam have that righteousness? How could Adam be created with eternal life? Because God made him perfect. Because Adam was created under the principle, under the promise of God that in Christ all creation is blessed. Adam was created under that promise. The purpose of God for the human race was that they will receive eternal life, righteousness, and everything in Christ before sin. That's how Adam was created. We, we don't usually think about it, but Adam was created alive. What life did he have? Eternal life. Okay. Where did he get it from? What law did he have to obey? No law. Why? Because he was created under the promise that in Christ all creation is blessed. Am I saying any heresy in here? You all following me? Okay. Wasn't there one commandment he had to keep though? Not to go to the... the, the he had to keep. But was he alive when he kept it? Was he alive first or he kept it first? He was alive first. He was alive first. What life did he possess? Was he righteous before he kept it? Where did he get the righteousness from? He was created as the son of God. He was created under the promise. Notice the word that I'm using. I'm not using a covenant. I'm not using a word agreement. I'm, using, I'm saying Adam was created under the promise. Now, I can, I can have an agreement with Mark. Mark, I'll give you $300,000. You give me your house. 
Right? That's an agreement. I have to give him the 300,000. In exchange, he will give me his house. That's a covenant. That's an agreement. Usually, we have a mediator in between us. We have a solicitor to facilitate it. By the way, if any of you started the book of Galatians, you will see Paul speaking there in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, to, and, and so on. But anyway, we won't get into that. But if Mark... I'll, I'll do the promise, not you. If I promise to give Mark $300,000, what does Mark have to do? Does he have to give me his house? If I promise to give him... I'm not making an agreement with him. You give me your house in check. I promise 300... Nobody promises to give $300,000. If I promise to give Mark $2, that's more reasonable in our day. Mark has to do nothing. All what he has to do is receive it. The promise is based on my ability to fulfill it. The promise is based on my honor and the validity of my word. I promised it, I fulfill it. Adam was created under the promise that in Christ all creation is blessed. Adam didn't have to do anything in exchange to receive the blessings. It is a promise from God. And God fulfilled his promise by coming down, breathing the breath of life in his nostril. And Adam came to life. He came to life possessing eternal life, possessing righteousness, possessing blessing and honor and glory and, and dominion over the whole world. All I had to do is believe what he heard from God. God told him, son, you are my son. Am I? Yes. Okay. I give you dominion over all the world. Yes? Yes. All right. I'm the owner of all the world. Simple. Adam just believed what God said. This is how Adam was created. This is how everyone in the whole universe was created. In Christ, they are blessed. You all following me? So Adam's blessings were purely dependent on the principle or the promise of God that in Christ, all creation is blessed. Now, the angels, I believe, were created under this promise also they were created possessing righteousness they were created holy because they're created under this principle because that's what the bible said in him all things visible and invisible consist and have their being but we all know that lucifer rebelled right we don't have to go there in in isaiah 14 and ezekiel 28 we know that satan said I will place my throne above the Most High. And I will be like the Most High. In Ezekiel we are told that he, he, he was proud of his beauty. And sin was found in him. That's what the scripture says. In other words, I want to put that in the context of the story of the everlasting covenant that we are looking at now. Lucifer, some time whenever that was, in the days of eternity, was no longer content with what God has given him. He was no longer content being a recipient of life. I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be an author of life. In Acts chapter 3 verse 15, I think um, the scripture refers to Jesus as the Prince of Life. Look up your marginal reading. The word Prince is translated as Author. Jesus is the author of life. Amen. Lucifer wanted to be the author of life. He was no longer happy, no longer content with this principle that in Christ all creation is blessed. He forgot, maybe intentionally forgot, that he receives his life, sustenance and everything from Christ and he wanted to seek it his own way. I will be like the Most High. Sin was found in him and he rebelled against is it all right to believe that God is the author and Christ is the channel of the life? God is the ultimate author and the source of all things. That goes beyond saying. But the scripture says that Jesus is the author of life. That's Acts chapter 3 verse 15. Now what does the scripture mean by that? 
he's the author of life in the sense that he's the creator of the world, in the sense that he's the savior of the world, in the same sense as the creator and savior. Now, if you are to build a house, I don't know if you're a builder or not, but let's say you're not. You go to Masters, whatever this building company is, and you go and you pay them money and they build you a house. Now you stand up and you say that I built my house, right? You're telling somebody, you talk, did you buy this house? Yeah, we bought the land, but I built the house. But did you actually physically build it? No. Who built it? Builders. The builders. The builders can say, I built the house also. Both of you can say, but the builders got their power or authority or money from you. So the source of the power or authority or money is you. But the one who actually physically did it is the builder. The same thing with God and Jesus. The Bible tells us that God created all things through His Son. The source of power and life and everything is the Father. But the Father chose to do it through Jesus. So what you're saying is in effect correct. Jesus is the channel. But to go by what the scriptures reveal in Acts chapter 3 verse 15, Jesus is the author of life also. In the sense that He's creator, sustainer and as I just explained. Does that make sense? But what you're saying is correct. I'm not denying. Uh, it is correct. Alright, so back to our point. Lucifer rebelled against his principle that in Christ everyone is blessed. He rebelled against it. He said, I will be like the Most High. I will place my throne above the Most High. He was jealous. He rebelled. And as a result, we know there was war in heaven. He was kicked out. And he lost eternal life. But the rebellion of Satan did not stop with Satan. We all know that. The rebellion found its way to the Garden of Eden, to Adam and Eve. And when, when Satan came tempting uh, Adam and Eve, what did Eve tell the serpent in response? Told him, no, 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 we can't eat that. God said we should not eat from it. The day we eat, we will die. That's what she said. That's how she saw it. Now, why is that? I sometimes stop and wonder. I mean, was that fruit poisonous? Why is it that God said, the day you will eat of it, you will die, or dying you will die, the literal translation. Why is that? Because by you rebelling against the authority of God, you are departing from the purpose of God. Yes? Amen. God's purpose for man was for man to have life through his son. By you disobeying, you are departing from the purpose of God. Can you find life anywhere other than in the son? No. Satan said, yes. I will be like the most high. He rebelled. He left heaven. Came down to earth. Tempted Eve. Thou shalt not surely die. What is he telling her in effect? They both understood that God told them, they both, both understood that God is the only source of life. But by Satan telling her that you shall not surely die, what is he in effect telling her? Hmm. Either have life in yourself, or don't believe that you can only find life in Christ, you can find life elsewhere. That's what in effect he was telling her. And unfortunately, unfortunately Eve fell for it. And Eve uh, listened to him and, and she sinned. But the way I see it, Satan's temptation was a direct attack against the purpose of God for man. God said, you will have life in my son. In Christ, all creation is blessed. Satan came and said, you shall not surely die. Surely you will find life elsewhere. It was a direct attack against the purpose of God. Now, how is it that man is to have life through Christ? Is it just a legal transaction? I'm talking about before sin. How is it then? We can't explain it, but it's, it's creation. It's it is creation, yes. Now, when, when Jesus came and breathed the breath of life into the nostril of Adam, what did Adam become a possessor of other than righteousness and, and eternal life? We all know that. 
But in effect, what brings all this? What brought all this to Adam? Christ's life. Christ's life. What qualifies any person to have eternal life, to have righteousness, is possessing the life of God, is possessing the life of Christ. Adam, before sin, was created possessing the life of God. The scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23, that we are his body, the body of Christ, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus fills all and is in all. Of his, that is. And Ephesians 4, 6 and Colossians 3, 11 pretty much say the same thing. That Christ is all and in all. So what is this telling us? When it says all, is it only limited to the human race? By this I'm not saying it's in trees. I'm talking about intelligent Creatures, all those who qualify to be the sons of God, the only reason they can be possessors of eternal life is that they are possessing the life of God, the life of Christ. So anybody who is created under the principle, in Christ, all is blessed, is a created possessing the life of God. That's pretty much what it is. Now, When Adam was created, he was created possessing the life of God. And hence, he was created righteous and holy and possessing eternal life. Because he had that life of God, he was in the image of God. But what happened when he sinned? What happened when he sinned? Cut himself off from God. He cut himself off. He departed from the purpose of God. He took on death, not life. Now, just to focus a bit more on that aspect, as far as the Bible reveals to us, there is only two intelligent creation that are called the sons of God in the scriptures, as far as the Bible reveals. These are angels and the human race. Yes? I have no doubt that there are other creation, but to, be, to limit ourselves by what the Bible reveals, there is angels and the human race. Both of these creations were created with the moral image of God. Do we agree? By moral image of God, I'm saying that they were created holy, undefiled, without sin, and righteous. And because he had the image of God, he had the life of God, he had the righteousness of God, he had the, everything that comes with it. So being in the image of God facilitated this this, this uh, eternal life or this application of this principle but when Adam sinned Adam and the whole human race they lost they no longer reflected the image of God the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 14 verse 2 and 3 come with me to Psalms chapter 14 the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone astray. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Adam and Eve sinned. Because of their sin, they lost the image of God. They lost the moral image of God. The moral image of God was, was marred in them. We look at it a bit deeper now. They lost the spirit of God. And as a result, the whole human race is born not reflecting the perfect image of God. That's what the scripture reveals. God looked down, there is none righteous, no, not one. Why? Because Adam departed from the purpose of God. And God respects a principle that he reveals in his word in, in Romans chapter 6. He says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants? To obey his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of righteousness unto life. God respects that principle. Adam chose to obey the author of sin. God had to respect the choice of Adam. And because of his choice, Adam lost the perfect image of God. Adam lost this righteousness, Adam lost this eternal life, Adam lost all these blessings that God gave him. Now tell me something. 
had you, just, just this group, just you were privileged enough, just you, no one else, I reserve this right to you, were born before Adam sinned. How do you think you would have been born? Would, would, you, would you have been born righteous? Yes. Would you have been born possessing eternal life? Yes. Why is that? Thank you. Because Adam reflects the perfect image of God and we are born after the image of Adam. If you are born after the image of something perfect, what will you be? Easy. Nobody contends that. But Adam lost this perfection. Adam lost the image of God. And guess what? We are still born after the image of Adam. So you are born without having the righteousness that Adam had before sin, without having this eternal life that Adam had before sin, without having all these blessings that Adam had before sin. Simply because the person we come from does not have it anymore. And Adam cannot give to me what he does not have. Sure. You can't give me a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars. It's as simple as that. So from being created under the principle of in Christ all creation is blessed, and as a result, receiving all the blessings that God could give him. That's perfection, dominion, oneness with God, and the lot. Adam forfeited all these blessings. And as a result, he hands to us, down to us, what he has. We all forfeited all these blessings in him. He says our inheritance is that of sin. Amen. Amen. Our inheritance is that of sin. In Romans chapter 5 verse 12, the Bible tells us, Wherefore, Romans chapter 5 verse 12, just flip your Bible, so make sure you're all refreshed. Romans chapter 5 verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Do you, is it the King James? Do you have, do you have King, New King James? I don't know if your marginal reading will say the same thing. Does anybody have a marginal reading for for that all have sinned? It's in the King James in the marginal reading to confirm your point, Tony. What does it say? It says strength in cooperating with God. That's Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Nobody has a margin read? Just a minute, it'll be here. No, 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 don't go references other verses. Just a margin reading, which means another translation or other words that this verse can be put in. Okay. Nice. Man, I must have a special Bible. <laughs> my Bible is in my bag. The, the margin of reading in the King James for the words for that all have sinned is in whom all have sinned. Ha uh ha! -huh. We've got a witness in it. The words for uh, for that all have sinned, these Greek words can be translated in whom all have sinned. Why is all the human race mortal? Why did, why did death pass upon the whole human race? Why? Who sinned? God said it, yes, but who sinned? Adam sinned. Because Adam sinned, he lost immortality, conditional immortality, and as a result, I am born of him in his image, immortal. It's simple, not complicated. Death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, or in whom all have sinned. Same meaning, same thing. We all are born mortal because Adam sinned. Full stop. So, as a result of Adam's sin, death passed upon all men. In verse 14 of the same chapter, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even after those that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So, death passed upon all men. Why? Because Adam 
lost immortality it's as simple as that where in Christ the whole creation had eternal life now in Adam the whole human race had nothing but death that's as simple as that because of one man's disobedience all who should have been born of Eve possessing righteousness immortality dominion the lot are born now possessing death and the scriptures in Romans chapter 5 verse 19 says I'll just read a phrase of it says by one man's disobedience many were made what Many were made sinners by how many people's disobedience? One man. By one man's obedience, disobedience. Because of Adam's disobedience, you are made a sinner. That's what the Bible says, plain English. Now, this sounds a bit doom and gloom, I know. But that's not all what I have to share. Okay, where am I? Now, what caused this change? You know that the Bible says that we are haters of God? Do you know that? That's in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. While we were yet enemies, look up that word enemies. Look up different translations. It says it in plain English. But look up that word enemies. It means haters. While we were yet haters of God, Christ died for you. Why? What? Why this change? Why is it that after Adam sinned, when God came down to walk with them in the garden, they ran away from Him? Why is that? I mean, it's not that they've never met God before and they're scared. They, they, they start and I don't know what they're going to do. They knew God. They knew that he loved them. But why did they run away now? What happened? You see the story of Adam's fall. Records for us. Reveals to us. Manifests to us. The root of the problem. Notice. The Bible tells us, first before we go there, that Jesus is the Word of God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of God. When, a when God created Adam and Eve, He gave them His Word. Amen. And through His Word, He said, Do not eat of the tree. Right? Sure. Jesus is the Word of God. When Adam and Eve were created, God gave them His Word, and through His Word, He said, don't eat of the tree because if you eat my son, my daughter, you will die. No problem. And this living word, the Bible says that the word of God is living, has living power in you who have faith. The word of God has living power. It's quick and powerful. That living word worked in them both to will and to do according to God's pleasure. Why did Adam and Eve do good works? Because the word of God, Christ, worked in them to do and to will according to God's good pleasure. <coughs> they received the word of God, they kept it in their heart, they kept it in their mind, and as a result they lived a righteous life before sin. Notice what happened though. Come with me to Genesis chapter 3. Let's go to the beginning. The beginning of our problem. Genesis chapter 3. Amen. Amen? Okay. Verses 4 and 5. Ye shall not surely die, Satan said. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall become as gods knowing good and evil. Hmm. What did Satan speak? Did he speak words? He spoke lies, but they words. Right? Adam and Eve 
received the word of God in their heart and in their mind and as a result they lived a righteous life but now another word comes to them ye shall not surely die what did Eve do? did she receive this other word? Eve received this other word and by receiving this other word that other word was quick and powerful in her life. That other word willed and did according to the good pleasures of the author of this other word. Now why do I say that? In Genesis chapter 3 verse 2 and 3 are Eve's words before she received the words of Satan. Notice what she said. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but if the fruit of the fruit of the tree which is in the garden, in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Were her words good? Yes. Was she reflecting the mind of God? Amen. Was she reflecting the authority? Was she reflecting the heart of God? Amen. Yes. Why? Because, because she had the word of God. Mm. Notice what happened after she received the words of Satan. Notice whose mind did she reveal. In verse 6, the same chapter. Now, after she received the words of Satan, notice how she started seeing things. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto, also unto her husband with her and he did eat. In here, she said, God said, we shall not eat because if we eat of it, we shall surely die. In other words, she said, it's tree that is not good for food. She received the words of Satan. The words of Satan started working in her and then she started manifesting whose mind? And she looked and she saw things totally opposite to how God saw them. She looked at them and she said, Wow, this tree is pleasant for eating. It is good for food. And look, if you eat it, it will make one wise. Did the tree change? Did God reveal something to her? What changed? Amen. If she did not receive the words of Satan, nothing would have happened. But she received the words of Satan. And by receiving the words of Satan, something happened. She partook of the mind of the author of these words. Before she, she received the words of Satan, she received the word of God and what she partook of is the mind of God. And God spoke through her, to her, and through her there and said, this tree is not good for food. If you eat it, you will die. But after she received the words of Satan, she started manifesting the mind of Satan. She started thinking the way Satan would think. She started speaking words the way Satan would speak. She started doing actions the way Satan will act. She picked off the tree and she ate. And as a result, she was manifesting the life of Satan. That, that is very true. So that we have a principle then that if you do not believe the word of God, you will receive a lie. Amen. That's what so, the Bible says. Yeah. So then the fear is, is that she must not have believed the word. She may have uttered it, but she did not believe it. So then That's for true. us the danger is, is not to know the word of God. But to believe it or we are going to see things upside down. That is very true. Whose word are we receiving or believing? That's right. You believe the word of God, you will manifest the mind of God. You believe the word of Satan, you will manifest the word of Satan. But the unfortunate thing and deferred thing is that 
we are no longer born the way Adam was created. Adam was created with the word of God in his heart and in his mind. We are no longer born that way. Eve received the words of Satan and hence she partook of the mind of Satan. Where once the mind of God was guiding her, was leading her and as a result she was speaking the words of God, she was doing the works of God, she was living the life of God. Now she received the words of Satan and as a result she was speaking the words of Satan tree good to eat she was thinking the thoughts of Satan she was acting the act actions of Satan picking of the tree and she was manifesting the life of Satan Adam brothers and sisters was created with a spiritual mind Adam was created with a mind controlled by the Word of God by the Spirit of God but that mind was marred then and there because Eve received these other words she partook of the mind of Satan and the human race became a possessor of a carnal mind which is none other than the mind of Satan himself and the spirit of Satan, yes. the spirit of Satan. that's what just the example there in, in, in Genesis chapter 3 reveals to us just look at the thinking of Eve how it changed after she received the words of Satan and you will see whose mind is working through her and we are born after the image of Adam. And if Adam became a possessor of carnal mind, what will you be born possessing? A mind that loves God? A mind that longs to do the will of God? No. You'll be born possessing a carnal mind. This is the story as we read it in Genesis. And the Bible tells us, that the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Why? Because Satan is not subject to God. Neither does he seek the will of God. And the carnal mind is his mind. If the carnal mind is to have his free reign, if the carnal mind is to have his say, every one of you in here will be a Hitler. Do you know that? Don't point at Hitler as he's any inferior than any of us. Had it not been for the Spirit of God working in our hearts, we will be just miniatures, if not bigger than Hitler. Because if the mind of Satan, that carnal mind, that natural mind, to rule in our hearts, we will do nothing but the actions of Satan. So hence, after sin, Adam could pass to his descendants nothing but death, unrighteousness, a heart that does not seek God, a mind that does not receive the things of God, and a carnal mind which is enmity with God. That's what Adam passes to us. Doom and gloom, I know. But true. True? But stay for the rest of the talks to see the rest of the story. It's not finished yet. So because of Adam's disobedience, the image of God was marred in man. And now man became a partaker of the image of Satan, the mind of Satan. So in short, to sum up what we've looked at this morning. God's purpose for man was that man was for man to have eternal life through his son. That's how man was created. That's how angels were created. Adam departed from the purpose of of God by him and Eve choosing to disobey God said they said we no longer want to partake of this principle because we believe we can find life elsewhere that's how the whole thing started in heaven Satan said I will be like the most high I no longer want to be under this principle man departed from the purpose of God God out of His love created us under the principle, the purpose, the promise that in Christ we are blessed. Man departed from it. Will sin and Satan be able to change the purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God for you? No. Will the rebellion of man, will the rebellion in, of angels in heaven be able to change the purpose of God for you. 
Does God still have the same purpose for us? The exact same purpose He had for Adam when Adam was created? Yes. Amen. This is, brothers and sisters, the whole controversy in miniature. It's the love of God against the hatred of Satan. It is good against evil. It is God against Satan. It is the purpose of God, the promise of God against the words of Satan. In the coming sessions, we will see whether sin was able to change the purpose of God or whether we are still under that purpose. But for now, let us have a short order of prayer. We have a break and then if you're up to it, we can have another session now. Let us have a short word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, our human language cannot describe how thankful we are to you. Our words will fail. Our hearts fail us, dear Lord. We cannot thank you enough. Pray, dear Lord, for forgiveness for each and every one of us in here, for all For all the sins that we have manifested, for all the wounds that we have placed upon Christ, forgive us, dear Lord. And Father, as we continue to look upon your deep purposes, your eternal purposes, give us understanding. And as we hear these words, draw us closer to you, we ask in Jesus.